So my name is Guillaume Boisset. I am a senior graphics engineer at AMD. Uh, and today I'll be, I'll be walking you through how you can add some real-time ray tracing effects to your existing, probably, Rust-based renderer. Uh, so we're not going to be talking much about Unity today, uh, even though I'll mention some of the work that we did with the Unity team a bit earlier this year uh, on their GPU progressive light mapper. Uh, which you might have heard of if you uh, assisted to yesterday's talk. Uh, but really, in this talk, we'll be focusing on what are the solutions that uh, AMD offers when it comes to ray tracing and to real-time ray tracing. All right, so there's many two, two solutions. Uh, they have um, different goals and different feature sets. Uh, therefore, they kind of target a different audience. Uh, so on the one hand, We've got a Radeon Pro Render. Uh, so Pro Render is like your uh, typical GPU-based complete renderer. Uh, it handles everything essentially. So it handles the recasting part of the problem, uh, as well as the shading. So it knows about your materials, about your textures. Uh, it's a physically-based rendering library that outputs the fully final rendered image. Uh, as such, ProRender is more intended for content creators, but if you're a developer and you're interested, the SDK can be made available on request, uh, which I'll mention a bit later. And on the other hand, the other product is Radeon Rays, uh, and Radeon Rays is a much smaller product, a uh, much uh, smaller feature set. It's only an intersection library. That is to say that uh, that's all it does. You give it some rays, and it will give you back the intersection. It doesn't do any shading. It doesn't know about your textures. It doesn't know about your materials. Uh, so it's up to the application developers to uh, implement the shading. All right, so as I mentioned, ProRender is available for developers. If you're interested and uh, want uh, to have access to the SDK, please get in touch uh, with Bruno at uh, this email. Uh, and what you'll find is a C API. So essentially, we expose a bunch of functions uh, that allow you to create a scene, add some geometry, add some textures, some past effects, and render. We implemented ProRender using OpenCL 1.2, which gives us nice cross-platform uh, abilities. And on Mac, we recently added Metal 2 uh, support. So it's completely cross-platform, runs across all major OSs, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, and even though it's an AMD product, uh, it's also uh, vendor agnostic, so you can expect it to run on AMD, NVIDIA, Intel. Uh, for content creators, there's two ways you can get hold of ProRender. Uh, there are plugins for different DCC tools like Maya, Max, Blender. Uh, and it's also directly integrated into Cinema 4D and Modo. Okay, so ProRender is yet another GPU-based renderer, uh, but it has some interesting features that I want to highlight in the next slides. Uh, so the first one is we have full heterogeneous device support, so we can run across multiple uh, devices, like multiple GPUs, but also across uh, different devices, like a GPU and a CPU. Uh, see, here on the right, you see a little test render using multiple GPUs, and as you can tell, uh, both devices don't have the same computational capabilities. Uh, so the way we deal with this is we start with an even split and send the same number of pixels across both devices, and then as the render goes on, we monitor the uh, computational power of each device and adjust the split accordingly. Uh, and the idea here is to have uh, each device that's been used finish the rendering tasks uh, more or less at the same time, uh, which allows for less, less latency and interactive renders. Our second feature uh, I'd like to highlight is that we have no limits for texture usage. So here's a little uh, benchmark test uh, using over 4,000 spheres, each of them having a 1K by 1K texture map. So that's uh, 4 billion pixels, or about 16 gigs of texture memory, uh, which is way more than we have on our device, uh, only 8 gigabytes. So we solve this by implementing out-of-core texturing, uh, which is to say that we we store the textures in system memory uh, up to the point where uh, system memory is full, and then we store them on disk and swap according to the needs of the rendering. Uh, and finally, our Metal supports on macOS. Uh, as far as we know, we're the only GPU-based renderer to have proper support for Mac. Uh, the, uh, the plugins are already available. They're not in beta, actually, anymore. I thought I had updated this slide. Uh, they're fully production-ready, so you can get them for Maya and Blender, and they, uh, they've 
cinema for the integration has been made available uh, a bit earlier this year. Well, here's a bunch of recent updates and improvements uh, made to ProRender. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those, uh, just a brief overview. Uh, the first one we did, we improved our heterogeneous volume rendering. Uh, we've made it more computationally efficient and reduced our memory use. Uh, here you can see some uh, a render of a bunch of open VDB volumes that get uh, rendered seamlessly alongside uh, regular surface objects, such as the spheres. Uh, we've improved our Uber material. Uh, essentially, we implemented the uh, Disney principle BRDF, uh, and it should be much easier, much more intuitive to use for artists as a support for the Metallicity workflow. And finally, we added a, a real-time denoiser, um, not machine learning based one, but just like a post-processing effect style uh, real-time denoiser. All right, here's in the next two slides, uh, I have a little Hello World uh, piece of code uh, showing you how to get set up with ProRender. You don't need to read the code, uh, I'll go quickly. Uh, I just want to point out that if you run a Mac and you want to use Metal, um, well, you can just add this uh, one little flag in after context creation and everything in ProRender will switch to Metal. The, the slides will be available later on and, and if you want to have a look later, that, that'll be fine. So here we're going to create a scene, uh, create a cube mesh, create a camera and a point light. Uh, we're ready to create our frame buffer and render. So if you execute that code, you'll get a nicely shaded cube. And that's, that's a good start when you do graphics. Um, all right, the second product uh, is Radian Rays. As I mentioned, that's a ray intersection library. So that's all it does. Uh, as with ProRender, it's OpenCL based and completely cross-platform, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, again, it's vendor agnostic, so it doesn't run only on AMD. Uh, and, and the main strength of Radian Rays is because they implement such a small feature set, uh, we can make the API very, very minimal, very simple. There's essentially only two things you can do with it, uh, which is commit some geometry, so we can generate the acceleration structure uh, for ray tracing, uh, intersect some rays. Uh, such an approach of being very minimal uh, makes it the perfect candidate for integration into larger code bases, which is uh, what the Unity team did with their light mapper. Right, it's a wavefront-based uh, ray tracer. That's to say that you typically don't give a single ray to Radian rays uh, and expect the result back synchronously. Uh, rather, you fill uh, a buffer, uh, a batch of rays, and send all those rays at once to, to Radian rays, which will then give you back the intersection result for every ray. Uh, and the reason for such an approach uh, is that it allows us to write kernels that map much better to the execution model of modern GPUs, and you typically get the best performance um, with that approach. And typically about 10x faster than CPU ray tracing. So Radeon Ray has been feature complete uh, for a while now, so we've been focusing on improving its performance. We rewrote the BVH construction code on the CPU side and got about 10x faster builds using manual vectorization and, and multi-threading. Uh, we also updated the uh, memory layout of our BVH on, on the GPU side. Uh, essentially, we now have every node storing the bounding boxes of their children in the tree. Uh, and when you get at the leaf level, well, we have enough space to store the fully assembled uh, world space transform primitive, which means we don't need this extra auxiliary buffer, which we were using before to uh, fetch the vertices. Uh, we save on, on memory bandwidth during traversal. Typically, we see about 20% performance improvement for secondary rays. So all of this is available today. Uh, you can check it out on GPU Open uh, and get access to the GitHub page with the source code. Uh, and we're working hard on a Vulkan version, which is coming soon. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the Vulkan version, uh, just to say that we've retained most of the approach from uh, the OpenCL version, so it's still from based still a minimal API, even though it's in C now to match with Vulkan uh, and not C++ anymore. But really, the main, the main difference is that we've designed it for a flexible interrupt with the graphics pipeline. So in the previous version of Radeon Rays, OpenCL, we were pushing the work explicitly to the GPU uh, in, in the library. Uh, and this new version in Vulkan, instead, the commit geometry and intersection calls will take some user-managed command buffers 
and we just write commands to those command buffers. And then it's up to the application uh, developers to submit those commands to the, G to the GPU. And the, the reasoning behind this is that uh, as application developers, you typically have a much better idea of what's going on in your frame, uh, what's going on on your GPU. Uh, so you can schedule those workloads much more accurately. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that you can run your ready and raise workloads uh, asynchronously alongside your graphics tasks. Well, here's the Hello World example for Ready and Rays, the OpenCL version. So we start by uh, picking up an OpenCL device. We uh, add some geometry to the scene, add a bunch of rays, allocate our intersection data, which is uh, the data that Ready and Rays will write into, uh, the way we communicate with the application. And then we can query the intersection uh, and get the results. Well, in this case, we map the results back to CPU memory, but you don't have to. Uh, you can just write another kernel uh, and carry on. So Radian Rays was used uh, by Unity for their light mapper. Uh, and in this section, I'm going to uh, describe a bit some of the work that we did with them. Uh, but first, why do we want light maps? Uh, all right, light maps can give you very high uh, fidelity GI. Uh, so they're pre-calculated, which means uh, you can spend essentially as long as you want on your light maps uh, and make them look really good. Uh, but because they're pre-calculated, they're so very fast at runtime, right? It's just a texture lookup. Uh, that makes them suitable for consoles and PCs, but also for low-end devices, such as mobile, uh, and performance-critical devices, such as VR. Uh, they're so extremely flexible. It's very easy to mix and match your real-time information with your baked information, it's typically like some SSAO with some baked AO, very easy to mix and match. So that makes light maps very desirable. So what is the problem with them? Uh, I'm sure most of you are very, are very familiar with this problem, uh, and you might even have seen this slide yesterday. So you fire up the editor, you set up your scene, and then you want to know what it's going to look like. So you press the generate lighting button, uh, and then you need to wait for the lighting to be ready. All right, this can be a, a real problem for an artist's workflow in that you never work on the final uh, result or work on some kind of intermediate result and you don't see what the user will see. Uh, and it can take typically minutes to hours on complex scenes to, to get to the final result. So we want to improve on that situation uh, and one solution, of course, is to move the light mapping to the GPU. Uh, so interestingly, the, uh, light ma the Unity team already had their light mapper working on, on, C on the CPU, uh, and that's nice for us because we can compare performance quite easily. All right, so we moved uh, all the light mapping logic to the GPU uh, with Ready and Rays, and here are the timings of the full uh, light mapping times. So that includes the ray tracing, but also the overhead of assembling and processing the ray batches uh, and uh, all the compositing and filtering of the light maps. Uh, I'm just going to go a brief overview of those, this graph. So coming from the 8-core uh, CPU to the Vega GPU, uh, with the sponsor scene, we see 20x faster performance. Uh, with the blacksmith test scene from Unity, about 10x. Uh, and coming from Threadripper CPU, um, sponsor gets a 10x boost, and blacksmith uh, about 5x. And this is essentially the same diagram, but this time focusing on the ray performance. This is pure ray throughput in million rays per second. Uh, and we get exactly the same relative uh, performance. So from the A-core CPU, Sponsa gets a 20x boost and Blacksmith 10x boost. And from Threadripper, uh, half of that. So Sponsa is 10x faster and Blacksmith 5x faster. Right, this is only part of, of making the, the light mapper more responsive and, and fast. The other optimization, we, which gives its name to the light mapper, are the, the progressive updates. So it's a very, very simple idea, uh, and the idea is just that we, we're going to show the light mapping results before, before the light maps are ready. So the, the rendering hasn't converged yet, it's very noisy as you can see, but we can still show the results uh, very early on. Uh, and the good thing about this is you get very fast feedback, uh, and even though the results are noisy, uh, as you can tell on that little video, you can get a pretty good sense of the final lighting pretty early on. Uh, and that means fast, uh, possibility for fast iteration, fast feedback, and you can change your scene and see what's going to happen. 
The second optimization is view prioritization. Uh, and that's very simple. Again, we want to reduce uh, the latency. So we just determine all the light maps that belong to objects that are currently visible in, in the current view frustum. Uh, and we're just going to focus the GPU effort onto those uh, light maps only. So the benefits of this technique is that it improves the artist's workflow. Uh, you get instant feedback on your changes. Uh, and the second benefit, which I think is very important, is I believe it promotes creativity as well. So, so if, if it takes hours for your changes uh, to be reflected on, on, the, on the final lighting, uh, chances are you're going to try avoid uh, wasting a lot of hours and you're going to plan your changes very carefully. If you get instant feedback on everything, uh, well, you can just start experimenting new ideas and, and try new stuff. Right, here's a little video showing the results of the progressive lab mapper. Uh, and here you can see very well the view prioritization uh, in effect. <laughs> So that was the light mapper. Um, so in this slide, I, I've uh, compiled a bunch of the of the things that we helped uh, Unity with. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, it's really just to like give you a bit of a sense of the the kind of work that goes into implementing such a such a technique. So one of the very first things that, that we realized when we started to profile the, the Unity code is they had lots of GPU execution bubbles. So, so that's to say that the, the GPU command processor uh, is idle because it doesn't have any more command to process. Uh, and that's not because the light maps have completed or anything. Uh, it's because the CPU is not sending those commands fast enough and therefore starving the GPU. So these were caused by unnecessary CPU-GPU synchronization points, which uh, we got rid of and managed to reach maximal GPU utilization. So that is, keep the GPU busy 100% of the time. The second optimization we did uh, is that the, the batches of rays provided by Unity to Radian rays were sparse, uh, in that they had some, some rays in the middle that were flagged as in, inactive. Uh, and while that's not really a problem in terms of functionality that's supported, uh, it typically generates inactive uh, lanes on your, on your device, and you don't get uh, full hardware utilization and the full performance. So we implemented ray compaction, uh, which is essentially taking all the active rays inside of a buffer and moving them towards the left of the buffer, uh, and only running the intersection on those. That means you get full SIMD utilization and you get the, the best performance. Run on a kind of higher level optimization, we also added light sampling. So the, the previous implementation uh, in the Unity editor was sampling every individual light in the scene explicitly on every subsequent bounce. So you add two lights, it's twice as slow. You add four lights, it's four times as slow. So instead, we uh, added power, power sampling, power light sampling. So as you bounce uh, around in the scene, we will select a random light based on its power. Uh, and the idea here is that the brighter the light, the more it will likely contribute to the final result. So by selecting it more often, we hope to reduce, uh, the, we hope to reduce the noise and converge quicker. Well, our next uh, kind of natural extension to this uh, technique are the light grids. Uh, and essentially, the light grids will do exactly the same uh, uh, computation of power distribution. 
But rather than doing it globally for the entire scene, we do it per individual little 3D cells belonging to a larger 3D grid that contains the whole scene. Uh, and then as you bounce around in the scene, you can resolve which cell you landed in, load the power distribution for that cell, and, and select your lights much more accurately. Uh, and again, this reduces the noise and makes the convergence faster. And we also added a custom traversal kennel for transparency, so, so shadow rays that go, through, that go through alpha textures and do subsequent bounces pretty, pretty quickly. Okay, so the light, light maps are, are very nice. Uh, they're fast, they give you high quality, uh, but uh, ultimately they're limited. Uh, they cannot be updated at runtime, uh, at least not without a severe cost. So they're for static illumination only. Uh, that's like static geometry, static lighting. So that brings me to my next topic, which is uh, real-time ray tracing with ProRender. Right, in this section, uh, the last section of the talk, we're going to be tackling two main issues that we have seen. Uh, the first one is the scalability of the, the graphics code. Uh, and that's an issue that's been a pretty big issue for, for previous generations of graphics APIs. Uh, and then there was a heavy driver overhead uh, around lots of calls to, to the graphics APIs and, and every draw call. Uh, and there was also this inability to scale across multiple cores of the CPU. So we see Vulkan as the, the perfect solution uh, for this, but uh, Vulkan, as some of you may know, can be uh, a little bit overwhelming when you want to, when you want to learn it. Uh, there's lots of code, lots of concepts. So we introduced uh, a library called Vulkan Easy, uh, which I'm going to describe further in the next slides. But the idea is you can keep most of the uh, improved performance from Vulkan, but you don't have to go through its API complexity. And the second issue, of course, is visual quality, which uh, we'll tackle with real-time ray tracing using ProRender. OK, so Vulkan Easy. Uh, the intent, uh, we really want to see uh, Vulkan API being as widely adopted uh, as possible. Uh, but as I mentioned, it can be pretty difficult to learn. Uh, typically requires loads of code to do stuff that uh, previous generation API you could do like in a few dozen lines of code. So it can be a bit overwhelming. So we intend to provide a simplified layer uh, on top of Vulkan, which allows you to learn the Vulkan API while, uh, while not having to go through all the explicit responsibility of low-level synchronization. <coughs> um, one important point of the Vulkan Easy API is that it maintains the existing API semantics. Uh, and why that's important uh, is because it allows very easy and natural interrupt with native Vulkan. So lots of the objects that are created in Vulkan Easy are actually raw native Vulkan objects. So they can be sent straight away to Vulkan uh, and vice versa. Vulkan, uh, Vulkan created objects can be used in Vulkan Easy. There's a few exceptions to this, um, but it's true for a lot of them. And that means it's very easy to interact with like a native Vulkan code or like an external Vulkan library or something like that. So Vulkan Easy is a slimmed down version of Vulkan, but it retains uh, most of the performance goodness of Vulkan, and that's uh, multi-threaded command encoding to be able to scale across multiple CPU cores, uh, support for multiple GPU queues, asynchronous compute, asynchronous transfers, and multi-GPU. And here's a list of some of the things that we, that we take care of in Vulkan Easy, uh, like swap chain management, memory management, pipeline permutation, uh, render pass management, as well as uh, Vulkan Easy allows you to, to submit, to change the graphics state uh, ad hoc, like at the last minute, which is uh, something Vulkan makes it a bit harder to do, really. Um, Vulkan Easy will also insert pipeline barriers automatically for you based on the data dependencies between the dispatches. SPV compilation, as well as GLSL reflection. Well, here's a little diagram showing kind of all the elements that are typically needed in an individual Vulkan frame. So there's quite a lot to it, as you can tell. And here's after uh, using Vulkan Easy. Uh, so you can see a lot of this goes away. A lot of the complexity is managed by Vulkan Easy, and that allows you to focus on, on writing your rendering code. Here's another way of looking at the same thing. So on the left here, you see the code that's necessary in Vulkan Easy to allocate a buffer. Uh, and the code really is only the little bit at the top. Uh, at the bottom, it's just a bunch of enums that are used in that particular code. 
Uh, so you can see it's pretty compact, uh, pretty minimal. On the right side, you've got the Vulcan code, which is much more verbose. Here's a second example, pipeline creation. Uh, and I really starts to get out of hand on the Vulcan side. Uh, and Vulcan is, is, again, pretty compact, very readable and expressive. OK, so moving on from Vulkan Easy, uh, and now real-time ray tracing with ProRender. Uh, essentially, the motivation for this really comes from uh, realizing there's this, this two sides to rendering these days. So on, on the one hand, we've got the offline uh, renderers uh, that typically implement some kind of Monte Carlo path tracing algorithm or something like that. Uh, and they aim for very high quality, often photoreal, but they suffer from very long render times. Uh, they sometimes offer interactive previews, but these previews are not really real time and they're very noisy. On the other side, we've got uh, your game engine renderers like Unity, uh, and they're much more relaxed on their physically based approach, so they allow for approximations. They rely a lot on fake and baked effects, uh, such as light maps, for example. But they don't suffer from noise, and they are fully real time. So what we want to do is we want RayTracer to, uh, we want sorry, ProRender to be able to extend your your raster renderer by adding uh, a bunch of uh, ray tracing effects. We have a few of them, and you can choose which one you want enabled or not uh, based on your hardware capabilities and your graphics uh, your graphics quality uh, targets. So such a technique, combining the rasterization of real-time engine with uh, ray tracing techniques, is called hybrid rendering. And the idea is to combine the best of both worlds. So we keep rasterization where it's good at, which is primary visibility and primary lighting. Uh, gives you noise-free, very fast feedback. Uh, and we keep ray tracing where it's good at, which is secondary uh, effects, uh, secondary lighting, and more complex effects. So this is using our uh, Vulkan version of uh, Radeon Rays. Uh, and we've implemented a bunch of effects for it uh, that you can choose from, like ambient occlusion, glossy reflections, diffuse GI, or area lighting. And the idea is you can uh, decide to enable those effects, uh, all of them, some of them, based on your hardware capability and the graphics quality that you want. Uh, of course, we're still using ray tracing uh, Monte Carlo integration, which means we get some noise. Uh, and we tackle this noise by using our, our wavelet filter denoiser that I mentioned a bit earlier uh, in the talk. And here I have a little video that uh, highlights what uh, this hybrid rendering technique I just mentioned. And there's no audio. Okay, so how is this uh, implemented uh, uh, on the application side? So we follow a, a pipeline very similar to the deferred shading pipeline. Uh, so that means that during the rasterization pass, the first pass, we, we're not going to do any lighting calculations. Uh, instead, we're going to fill the, those images, you can see, called G buffers, or geometry buffers. Uh, we fill them up with information about the visible objects, like material information and, and position normals. So we have three of those. Uh, the first one is the albedo and transparency. Uh, then we've got normal and depth, uh, as well as some mesh identifier. Uh, and finally, roughness and metallicity, which we can use to generate our, our reflections. Uh, and motion vectors, which are very important for filtering. Uh, so we can use motion vectors to know where the pixels were in the previous frame, and denoise across time, even though stuff is moving in the scene. So the interesting thing to note here is that once you have those G buffers, you have all the information you need to start uh, gener gener generating rays and, and tracing them, uh, which means you can start generating uh, batches of work from Radian rays very early on in your frame and, and run stuff asynchronously alongside graphics. Uh, the first effect we implemented uh, is ambient occlusion. So this is true ray traced uh, ambient occlusion. Uh, which means it doesn't suffer from typical artifacts that real-time techniques uh, usually uh, exhibit. Uh, 
so you can apply this uh, immune occlusion uh, effect to um, to like the direct illumination component of an image-based lighting, uh, and because it's ray traced, it won't suffer from like missing thin objects and missing interactions and stuff like that. So it's what we did on that on that image, and you can see it gives you this kind of very nice uh, contact soft shadow uh, and makes the elements more grounded in the world. Uh, in terms of performance, we've tested the technique on moderate scenes, so that's to say like uh, a little bit under a million triangles. Uh, we see about 500 to 600 million rays per second uh, of ray throughput, so depending on the number of pixels that you need to process, uh, typically ends up being a few milliseconds in your, in your frame. The second effect we added are uh, glossy reflections. Uh, and again, these are true ray trace reflections, so they don't suffer from uh, like problems of screen space techniques, such as screen space reflections, where if your ray leaves the screen, all of a sudden you don't have any data for your reflections. So we don't suffer from that. We can also have multiple bounces. Uh, and the way it works is we dispatch a compute shader over, over the G buffers, determine which pixel needs uh, reflection rays, accumulate them into a batch, and send the batch over to Radian Rays for asynchronous ray tracing. And at the end, we have a resolve kernel that will uh, calculate the illumination from the intersection data. Uh, Performance-wise, we see um, a very similar numbers to immune occlusion, same throughput, really, which was a bit surprising to me at the beginning. Uh, right, immune occlusion rays are typically very short-lived, so after you've traveled a sufficient distance on an AO ray, you can just, you can just give up and early out. Uh, which means they should be faster than reflections, uh, but these are glossy reflections, so the, the rays are a lot less divergent, uh, a lot more coherent than your immune occlusion rays, which means they, they hit the GPU caches a lot more, which compensate, uh, and you end up with kind of the same throughput overall. And finally, you can add refractions. Um, again, multiple bounces uh, through ray trace refractions. Uh, and this time we see a higher performance, about three times the performance, 1 to 1.5 billion rays per second, and that's because uh, reflection ray, uh, refraction rays are, are a lot more coherent uh, than all the others. Well, and finally, that's not enough for you. Uh, you can go full GI. Uh, and this, this again starts from the, your G buffer, so this is still a hybrid rendering, but this time on the ray tracing side, we solve the full light transport uh, equations. Uh, and give you the, the final uh, unbiased results. Uh, so here we see the lowest performance, uh, because when you start to deal with diffuse GI, these are the most expensive rays. They are fully divergent, and you cannot early terminate them. So about 300 million rays per second. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the end for that section. So let's just do a little recap of the things we saw uh, today. So I gave you the latest updates on, on Radeon on Radian Pro Render, Radeon Rays, well, the uh, new features that were added recently. Uh, so went a bit through the uh, Unity GPU Line Mapper that's uh, using Radeon Rays. Uh, and finally, introduced Vulkan Easy, so a, like a slim layer on top of Vulkan that makes it easier to use Vulkan. Uh, and finally, real-time ray tracing with Radian uh, ProRender. So if you want access to any of the SDKs, please get in touch with Bruno at uh, this uh, email. He's the lead on that project. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you very much for your time.